Thanks, Rob. I learned something new. Dr. Hanley, I didn't know you went to NC State, because I went to Chapel Hill. So it might be good that Dr. Coley is between us. Uh -huh. there you go. Okay. I think we can... Didn't speak. go so well the other night, so... You know what? I mean, okay. for us, but... Wait for it. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm glad we're all friends. Uh, <laughs> So the first question is is sort of a softball, and both of you teach on this, and we've had conversations about this. And I'll start with Dr. U with you, Dr. Coley. Um, what is your philosophy of education? So before we even get to how we do education, we have to understand why we do what we do. So what's your philosophy? Sure. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, what a privilege it is for me to sit between. Uh, my colleagues here, uh, really blessed to interact with both of them, blessed that you're here. Uh, my uh, first comment I'd like to make is dream big dreams. Ask the Lord to guide you where you're headed. Uh, I grew up 25 minutes from here, and if you had told me uh, when I was your age that I would be up here, uh, for this uh, special occasion, uh, I'm not sure I would have believed you. So stay at it, work each day. Uh, also, I don't want this to be just about my writing because I had the privilege of uh, working on a dissertation with both of my colleagues and uh, their dissertation work, their writing, intersects the ideas we're discussing today. So if they don't bring it up, I will. Uh, and lastly, I'm comfortable interacting with you as we go. Now we're gonna set aside some time at the end, uh, but if you would like to uh, jump in, uh, we're, we're here to share with you. Philosophy, uh, next year we'll make 50 years in teaching. I've gotten it down to one word, change. And that word change is there uh, in a synonym in the title of the book, Transformational Teaching. It's about change. And you're all familiar, every classroom, a great commission classroom. To say that is to say you believe the Lord is at work in the classroom and can be at work in the students. And so, one word, change. And I argue where no change takes place, no teaching and learning has taken place. And that's my motto, and that's what I share with you this afternoon. Where no change takes place, no teaching and learning has taken place. We've all met uh, those individuals who want to talk for 50 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes, nonstop, okay? Uh, and the question is, at the end of 50 minutes, has change occurred? And that greatest change takes place when the learner is engaged. There's tons of research that backs that up, but even more powerfully than the research, I would take you to the teaching methods of our Savior. And every page of the gospel, he is teaching for change, and he is engaging those that the Spirit led him to as he did ministry. The greatest change takes place when the learner is engaged. And in the book, there's lots of discussion about that. And I just close with one other favorite expression. I'll close this introduction. The one doing the work is the one doing the learning. The one doing the work is the one doing the learning. That's why I began uh, my little uh, first run presentation by saying, I invite you to participate because I really, really believe the one doing the work is the one doing the learning. 
Thanks again for being here. Thanks so much for that introduction, Dr. Coley. And uh, I would say in terms of educational philosophy, I've also distilled this down into one word. Um, it's actually a false cognate out of the Greek, and I've kind of turned it into a little bit of a mantra for me, and it's curiosity. And if you know a little bit of Greek, you'll know that uh, curious is Lord. And so uh, in English, when we think of curiosity, we think of uh, a sense of wonder and a sense of awe and a sense of just always asking that question, why? And I think as educators, when we can bring that into our classroom and bring that sense of wonder and that sense of awe to whatever subject matter we're teaching, we're going to be passionate about it. And our students will uh, build off of the passion and the curiosity that we bring into that classroom. But you might be asking, well, why in the world does he have to bring this weirdness up with the false cognate out of the Greek and all these other things? Well, simply this. If we're just asking the question, why, with no reason behind it and no sense of lordship uh, under the uh, lordship of Jesus Christ, we have a tendency to veer off course. We have a tendency to lose our standard. And we might have a tendency even to veer into skepticism. And so when we ask those questions and we bring up important and, and meaningful and weighty questions uh, to this sense of reality, to the cosmos, to uh, whatever subject we're studying, and we do that with a sense of responsibility under the Lordship of Christ, then we're much more likely to stay the path and to stay true to that. And I do that to kind of align under a couple different uh, Bible verses. Matthew 6, is a life verse for me. Um, but that kind of sets your priorities, right? So um, that talks about the kingdom and uh, doing everything that we do in the kingdom uh, really in alignment with uh, that priority. But then also Romans 12, 2, which is uh, be no longer conformed, but be transformed, right? And it's through that process of transformation and why we're here today to have this talk that um, that, that word transformation really um, is applying to uh, the students who are in the classroom. And so to maintain that sense of focus on the transformation that's happening with the students. So, there you go. I appreciate that. I'm gonna add a word. Um, when you were talking about asking why, my mind went to my three-year-old. Uh, so for those of us who have littles, we know that incessant why, why, why. Uh, but then I looked at our next question, which is about human development and psychology, and I thought about how we all grow and change from childhood into adulthood and how we develop because of that curiosity. And I think the Lord designed us to be that way, right? Is to ask those questions and incessantly ask why. <laughs> um, to, to learn and to grow and to change. So good. So in light of that, I'm going to punt to you first, Dr. Handler. Why is it so important then that educators understand and implement research? So psychological research, human development research, even the field of mind-brain education has flourished lately. Why why is that research so important for us as educators, as teachers? Well, you've punted to me, and I'm going to go back because I am certainly a disciple of uh, our master teacher on the, on the stage here with Dr. Coley. And something that he said was, um, if we don't implement best practices in teaching, we will have a tendency to teach the way we were taught. And if you were taught in a lecture style, um, you know, kind of educational setting, um, that is more than likely what's going to be comfortable for you. Just like think about family psychology. Um, whenever the stress comes on, and teaching is certainly a stressful profession, um, we tend to default or fall back on those default reactions whenever we're in a stressful environment. And so when the rubber meets the road and we've got 15 deadlines and we've got 1,000 uh, papers to grade and all these other things, we're just going to fall back on what's easy and what's default for us. And those default reactions will oftentimes be the way that we were taught in the classroom. And so if we don't know the research and we don't know the benefits of what we're calling active learning, um, cognitive interactive uh, learning, then really it's, it's going to be we fall back on that way that we were taught, the way that we were brought up. 
If we didn't have experiential learning, if we didn't have a more hands-on experience, if we didn't have a more social engagement with our learning uh, as we went through that uh, learning process, then we will more than likely fall back on the ways that we were taught. And those weren't always great teaching methods. Okay, So that's why I would say it's really important to understand and to know and then to apply uh, best practices when it comes to teaching. Outstanding, Dr. Handler. Outstanding. It was you. I just referenced you. That's why. <laughs> Look at the book. Uh, I would argue the first immediate response to the question that was posed, show me anything that is credible in the current discussion in education, mind, brain, education, research, neuroscience related to teaching and learning. Show me anything credible and I will draw a straight line from that research to the Gospels and show you Jesus modeling it for us. So as we applaud uh, what is going on in the 21st century, it doesn't give uh, veracity to Jesus. He doesn't need any research uh, for his credibility. But it highlights the genius of Jesus' teaching. Here's a question for you. Have you ever had a teacher who's been in the classroom maybe 20 or 30 years and they come across like a first-year teacher? You had that around the audience? I see people nodding. Absolutely. That person is a person who lacks reflective practice. That person is not evaluating his or her methodologies, the responses from the students. That person is not reading the current research and evaluating what they do. For instance, and I'll give you one quick illustration. Neuroscience has taught us about brain plasticity. Brain plasticity. When I was a kid growing up in the cornfields, uh, just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. I was taught from the earliest age, once you get your IQ test, that's what you're stuck with. That's who you are. Give me a wave. Have you, have you grown up with that thinking? Okay, a few of you have. As a young 21-year-old uh, middle school teacher, I said, I don't believe that. Couldn't prove it. My gut said, I don't believe it. Fast forward a few decades, all of the research in neuroscience says the brain can change, the brain can grow, people can get smarter. That IQ can expand, your skills can expand, and our uh, participants in our Bible studies, as well as any formal schooling you're involved in, you need to communicate to them the concept that they can expand, their mind can grow. There's an exception to that, and I'm talking, I'm the oldest guy in the room, I'm talking to myself. The exception is when you choose to become inactive. And at that point, pruning starts to take place and the brain and cognition start, start to wane. And I'm determined not to be that kind of steward. Okay, great start. Good, Good. thank you for that. I think I'm um, so we've talked about uh, lecture-based learning. We've talked about engagement. I want to hone in on one particular topic underneath that, and that is cognitive interactive learning. Um, what does that mean? And what does it look like in practice? So as these, uh, as these folks would go out and teach in Sunday school or they would go teach in a classroom, what does it mean to do interactive learning? The Lord and Southeastern have given me a huge privilege 
to teach in seven different countries, uh, including uh, Panama, Mexico, Cuba, uh, and then to Africa, Uganda, uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Ukraine. And as I interacted with uh, students, Christian educators uh, in those countries, they all had one thing in common. They had all grown up in a system that said, sit and soak. Sit and soak. We have a sage on stage. You listen. Don't interrupt. Take notes. Spit it back on the exam. That's on the one end of the spectrum. The cognitive interaction, I would argue, is in the center. And then the far right would be John Dewey. There is no truth except for that which the student is going to discover based on their curiosity. And Dr. Hanlock centered that perfectly. Curiosity is crucial, but he centered his use of the word on truth with a capital T, absolute truth. So in the center is Jesus modeling for us to guide people to truth. And every page of the gospel, he's interacting with them. He's talking with them, giving them assignments. The disciples say, send them home. They're all hungry. McDonald's, Burger King, and Hardee's can't feed them all. And he looks at them and says, you feed them. He challenged them to be active participants as they built their understanding of what the Lord could do in and through them. I just feel so strongly that you begin with connect with prior learning and prior experience. Take two or three, four minutes of your lesson plan. Begin with connecting with prior learning and prior experience. That shows your respect of your learner. That shows your respect for the ones the Lord has assigned to you. So you connect with them. As the lesson develops, give them the opportunity to practice. Suppose you are a, a much celebrated seminary professor and you have planned a lecture and you need every minute of 45 minutes. I challenge you, stop after 10 or 12 minutes. Research says that the learners have taken in about as much as their chemistry can handle in about 10 or 12 minutes. They need a break and they need a chance to uh, have those chemicals built back up. Stop and ask everyone to summarize in a sentence or two what your lecture has been about for the last 10 or 12 minutes. And you stop talking and give them a chance to summarize. And then after you've written your summary, you share it with your teammate next to you. He listens to you, you listen to him, and then the lecture picks right back up. And a chance, and I just mentioned collaboration. Collaboration is huge a chance to work with classmates, to learn from them and they from you. And again, you're communicating, we respect you. I'm afraid, I'll close with this, I'm afraid when we talk for 50 minutes uninterrupted, we are communicating, I'm the only intelligent person in the room and if you're teaching church Bible study, you might communicate, 
I'm the only person qualified to speak about the passage. And I don't think that's what you want to communicate. Dr. Hanlon, would you add anything? I'm going to push you to add something soon. But, um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Coley referenced the dissertation that uh, he supervised that I wrote, and I'll bring that up now. I we think this is a great... one in Chicago. We did, to a packed house. It was a lot of fun. Um, they, they were on the floor. They were <laughs> standing room only. It was, pretty, it was pretty monumental, I will say. Um, it helped that the keynote speaker had plugged uh, technology augmented classroom in his talk, and then we presented on the flipped classroom. Um, and then everybody just flocked to our session. It was a lot of fun. Um, the stuff a legend. But I've already dropped the name. And if you're not familiar already, I would encourage you to look up the flipped classroom as a teaching model. And it essentially, um, in an elevator speech format, it's where you, you move what's considered to be the low cognitive load portion of a teaching environment. And that's what we're doing right now with you, which we already joked about the irony, uh, talking about uh, cognitive interactive learning, and we're just talking to you. Um, but this is considered low cognitive load. We are speaking and you are receiving. It's very passive. And so uh, the technique in the flipped classroom or some have called it the inverted classroom, is to move that low cognitive load portion into an independent practice time. So typically, when you were growing up in high school or middle school, your teacher would give you the problems, which is the most difficult part, the independent practice, to do on your own when they were not there to help correct problems. So oftentimes, what you do Think about math. I was not a fantastic math student. I would reinforce the bad habits of, or poor thinking when I was in my independent practice time at home on my own, and I was completely lost because neither of my parents were great at math either, and so I didn't have anyone to go ask a question and socially stimulate whatever learning might occur, and so I just reinforced bad habits. Well, what the flipped classroom does is there, you have to have some direct instruction. We're not saying that you, you, there isn't any such thing as direct instruction. Of course there is. There's someone who has learned this before, who goes before, and organizes the content and presents that to you. But we can now mediate that low cognitive portion through video. So if you create a video in advance, and we're only talking, and I've seen this done in uh, interesting ways, 10 to 15 minute videos, okay? How many of you have seen the reels or the, the YouTube shorts? That's about as much time as people have an attention span for these days. So why would we fool ourselves into thinking that someone could concentrate for a full 30 minutes um, in, a, in a lecture format? So we mediate that content through video, and then when they come into the classroom, I have a very interactive, problem-based, social-based learning activity designed, which by the way takes me a lot of time to put together, but when the students come into the classroom, we are now interacting and that learning space is augmented by other people in that learning environment. And so in a nutshell, that's the, uh, that's the flipped classroom. And so I would encourage you to, to potentially explore that as an option. Um, it's harder to do in a Sunday school setting, but shrink down the time. And the second thing I would say is, um, oftentimes we think about what we're gonna say. Think about the question you're gonna ask. I spend twice as much time thinking up the questions that I'm gonna ask than I do planning the content that I'm gonna present. Because the meat, and you just look at our Lord and Savior and his, his teaching model, the meat of what he says is actually in the question. Some kind of provocative question. Why do you call me good? Right. How many, just Zinger. look at how many times Jesus directly addresses a question. Very, very few in the New Testament. Most of the time, he's turning that question back onto the questioner 
or he's following up with a question himself. That's a teaching technique. He's trying to get them to think through the reason behind why they were asking the question in the first place. Okay? And as educators, that's what we want to do. That's the kind of classroom I want to run. Dr. Kellen, I would turn it over to you to respond. I'm going to add a couple that I learned in our EDD program. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things that I try to do in my classes in every class period. One of them is at the very end, I'll give them a note card and say, write down three takeaways. Dr. Coley, I think you taught this to me as an exit ticket. I have to write down three takeaways, and then different students will share one of their takeaways. I do that when I teach Sunday school. I do that when I teach youth. I do that in classes here. It's widely applicable. One of the other things I do here, especially in our biblical foundations for counseling class, I'll give them a second index card, and they will write any questions that they have from that day. The next class period, I'll answer those questions to begin the class, which makes the connection back to the earlier material, and I can use that as, as the launching pad for that day's conversation. Um, and coming in with a good question, last week uh, when I taught that foundations class, I had slides ready, two sets of lecture slides to kind of get us going. We hit two in a three-hour class block. Two. There's no final exam in that class, so it's okay. I said, go read the slides on your own. But we spent two hours and 50 minutes talking about the questions that they had and the information that I posed a couple of questions, and we talked as a group of 35 students and me. I was sitting on a desk at the front of the classroom, not behind a podium, but got, got them engaged. And I guarantee you they would remember that better than me lecturing from a slide. Did you go home upset that you didn't get to cover no. all of the prep material you had in class? No, because it was a lot more fun. <laughs> I enjoy, you I enjoy the conversation. But it also goes back to something that we said earlier. I don't believe that I am the expert. I'm a co-learner, right? And think in parallel terms to Paul saying he's a co-laborer. We are, you as a teacher, when you are teaching, you're a co-learner. You're not the expert. And you have things to learn as well. That's what I love what we do, right, is we get to learn constantly. Another aspect of this, and Dr. Hanley, I'm going to punt to you first because this comes up in your uh, learning theory and instructional design class. But I love this topic. Um, talk about assessments. And not just exams, right? We all hate exams. Uh, but assessments, what do good assessments look like? Why do they help us? Why do we need them? I actually have a child who loves exams. Come on. I know. But um, so assessment is, a, is for some people a really interesting word, and it oftentimes brings negative connotations. So I appreciate you handing this off to me because uh, as in my new role uh, over institutional effectiveness, this is what I get to do with an excited community of learners at Southeastern. And I'm not talking about the students. I'm talking about the administration and the faculty. I actually help oversee all of the assessment activity uh, here on campus. Um, in the classroom environment, though, there are a couple of, I would say, best practices and things that I always try to keep in mind. First of all, there are two types of assessments that, um, as an educator, you want to put in front of your students. And the first one um, is simply formative assessment. We call formative assessment. And that's where you're helping along the way to form those ideas and concepts with the students. And so uh, they are learning, they're growing, they have an opportunity to receive feedback on their performance and then to change something about that performance or about the way they think about something, and then to try again. So that's formative assessment. And so um, it could be in terms of me asking the students questions, and it would be informal formative assessment, right, where they're just having a discussion with me. Um, oftentimes, I'll start a class with reading quizzes, and then as I begin to engage with them and ask questions throughout the semester, I might tail off those reading quizzes because I'm finding these students are really engaged with the reading material outside of class. Sometimes the reading quizzes stick all the way through the end of the semester um, because they need that accountability. But in that informal setting, I can really determine as now an experienced educator whether or not someone has read the material 
or if they're just kind of using prior learning but not referring to any specifics from the assignment that we uh, that I gave them between the last uh, meeting and this one. Another one is what's called summative assessment, and that's really, I think, what people often think about, and they, they really dislike this kind of summative assessment. And the summative assessment um, is that capstone assessment at the end of a program or at the end of a class. We're all coming up on it, right? It's dead week right now, and we're about to hit this summative assessment at the end. Well, that could be in the form of a final examination. It could be in the form of uh, some kind of oral examination. Uh, or in the doctoral program, uh, it's even your dissertation, right? So we have a couple different summative assessments. There's an, uh, a, uh, a written defense as well. But those are all seen as this kind of summative assessment, a, an end-all type of assessment that um, the students will take to determine whether or not they pass or they fail or some grade in between. So, Dr. Coley? Think of an exam that you took, and after cramming for the exam, and then staying awake to finish the exam, how long did the information stick with you? I see lots of zeros, and I heard it, it was gone. How long, anybody want to respond, please? How long did it stick with you? you I know you just don't want to admit it. The quickest time I've ever had a student uh, respond uh, with this question. She said, I forgot it before I got the test paper turned in. It was gone. And I look at my classes and I go, if you have that experience in my class, you go to the business office and tell them, don't pay Coley. And I'm dead serious. My wife's not thrilled about that challenge. <laughs> but don't pay me if you cram in information in short-term memory and then it's gone. I would add one further word of uh, educational conversation. Differentiation. Root word, different differentiation, give different tests, give different summative evaluations. Quickly, I taught high school English, and what does everybody learn to hate in high school? William Shakespeare. And my goal was for them to simply love the author and the plays. And so as a summative evaluation, there was no exam. There was no memorizing lines. There was a, no matching questions. Who said this and what happened in what particular order? I gave them the opportunity to design something themselves that used their natural abilities and interest. And they fell in love with Shakespeare. And at a 25-year high school reunion, they invited me back, and we were standing around in conversation. And student after student came up and said, Mr. Coley, I still like Shakespeare. I went to a play recently, and I think I achieved my goal. I just wanted them to like it. And one of the ways was to give them a choice in how they express their understanding. I think the important part here that we're getting on is that we don't get rid of assessments. We change them. Absolutely. And they're still meaningful. They're still necessary, but they're differentiated. I'm going to skip a question here and then go to that because we're talking about differentiation. How do we handle that we have diverse learners in the classroom? Not just learning styles, but... How do we handle that people learn different ways and absorb information differently, can be assessed differently? If we're one teacher and we have 30 students, how do we handle that? Both of you are looking at each other trying I to would pump say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just keyed it off. With differentiation, so. Anybody have two kids at home, two or more? Give me a, oh, lots of hands. Do they learn just alike? 
look at the eyeballs, the raised eyebrows, and I've asked large audiences the question, and everybody just breaks out with laughter. Of course they don't learn alike. And I said, but I've got an idea. Let's put 30 high school students together uh, in a particular room in church and teach them all the same way when you just admitted kids that come from the same gene pool don't learn alike. And a follow-up question, why do you teach the way you do? Dr. Hanla brought this up earlier. Many people teach the way they do because that's how they learn best. Newsflash, not everybody learns like you. So ask the Lord for forgiveness and wisdom to change your style I teach the way I do. Anybody want to finish the sentence? Because that's what my students need. I teach the way I do because that's what my students need. And you can change the content. You can change the process. You can change the product. And that's uh, laid out in our book, uh, three different pieces. What are you going to cover? How are you going to do it? How do they uh, exemplify what they've learned? You can differentiate all three of those. Anything to add? Sure. Maybe what that looks like in practice. Yeah, I was going to say, in a, in a classroom setting, and especially in Bible studies, uh, we teach a 12th grade class uh, at our church, and we are constantly, and my wife uh, has been a middle school math teacher uh, for a long time as well, and so she is excellent at engaging uh, that demographic, and so what we do, we always have something in our back pocket to group the students up, um, and there are two primary ways uh, that you can group people. So from a very practical kind of nuts and bolts level on differentiation or teaching um, diverse learners in the same classroom setting is how do you group the students so that they can challenge one another? And there are two different uh, directions you can go. The first one is through what's called homogeneous grouping. So uh, you understand at what level your students understand the content or have mastered the content. And when you know your students well enough to be able to group them homogeneously in kind groups, okay, then uh, you have some way to group them up. We, you, we love to use playing cards because you can hand them out. If you know high school students, um, they, sh they try all kind of chicanery and they try to switch cards. That's why you keep them on your toes. You either do the reds together or you do all the face cards together or you do, um, that gives you a lot of different ways to group them and keep them on their toes so they can't just switch with their friends. And then you watch them and you tell them to switch back. Um, so the homogeneous grouping allows them to work with people at their same level of mastery. And the conversations that they have with the people in that group will, uh, actually help them learn and grow a little bit uh, to better meet the, the learning standard that you've set for them. So that's one method, but you need to mix it up as well and to factor in what's called heterogeneous groupings. You probably knew where this, is, uh, where this was going. And so once you know the level of your learners, you can group uh, levels who, uh, learners who are at different levels. And those students will challenge one another, some, uh, will teach others in the group, and some need that peer to translate for them what in the world their teacher's saying, because they don't always understand what we understand, and it's difficult for them to learn from someone who's known this material for 30 years, okay? So they need a peer to talk on their level and explain it to them on their level. And so uh, when you can add in a variety of grouping methodologies and keep it fresh with the students in that way. Uh, don't always group heterogeneously or homogeneously. 
Um, but when you can do that in a variety of ways, it keeps your classroom environment fresh and new, and uh, the students really enjoy it and can engage that way. I mentioned uh, earlier the blessing of, of going to different countries. When you go to a country, uh, and my experience has been, I, I named Hispanic com countries that I've gone to and African countries that I uh, was able to teach in. When you do what Dr. Handler just described, you will be a rock star. And that's not your goal to go there to be a rock star. You're, you're there to share the gospel. But as you give them the opportunity to interact with the material, I promise you they have grown up in systems where they were never allowed to speak a word in a classroom. And they look at me like I have two heads. And then all of a sudden, they start to talk to each other. And the room explodes with the energy. I invite you to try it. That works with kids as well, oh. I've found. Because yeah. kids are often sat down and told to listen. But when you put them in groups, you, you might have to steer them on topic. Uh, but they tend to do that as well. The other thing that I would add is... When we do d different delivery methods, lecture, uh, reading, acting it out, group work, the more methods that we're using, the more learners we're hitting. So one of those methods is going to appeal to everyone. So if we can diversify our teaching methods, that also helps the reception of that. I'm gonna jump to the last one just for time. Land the plane for us. We are all preparing in some way, shape, or form to go into ministry, to be teachers, and to serve the church. So connect the dots, Dr. Hanlon first, between what we've been talking about and service within the local church, whether that be a Sunday school teacher, whether that be a pastor, a counselor. Why does this matter as we go into ministry? Yeah, early on, uh, we've been blessed to lead small groups, Bible studies, um, Sunday school classes, um, and all the way down in, in a variety of different churches throughout um, you know, kind of my married life. So my wife and I have always tag teamed the, on these kinds of things. And uh, early on, she would joke with me that you just talked the whole time. And I would come away and I would say, you know, our wives are great for um, sanctification and sharpening um, for, and a lot of other things. But she said, you just talked the whole time. And I said, well, yeah, I had a lot to say, and it was really important. She said, it wasn't that important. You know, um, as I grew and matured um, in my educational practice and in teaching, um, the Sunday school classes, the Bible studies, uh, the, the things that we were doing, I tended to grow more toward application, of course we need to interpret rightly. Absolutely we must interpret rightly. But if we are not applying that in the lives of the people who are in that learning context, then we are falling far short of the calling that we are called to. And so I've started growing into application, allotting additional time at the end where I shut my mouth and allow them to speak with one another. So there's first application, and then there's second, for me, is conviction. And what are the buttons that I can push on that will allow the Holy Spirit to work in this room? Welcome the Holy Spirit in. I think so many times, I'm going to say a joke, and it is a joke because I love Baptist people, but oftentimes, in Southern Baptist crowds, it's Father, Son, Holy Bible. We have got to allow the Holy Spirit in to our teaching and into what we're doing in the classroom. Because what we have to say is far less important than what the Holy Spirit wants to teach the people that we have been given responsibility to teach. What is your mindset as you prepare to present a Bible lesson. What is your mindset? Do you expect God to be at work? Or is it 
cover the material. Expect the Lord to work in you. Expect the Lord to change you through your study. Number two, expect the Lord to change those who are learners in your group. Here's the takeaway, Ephesians 2.10. They probably have a little side bet going how long it would go before I mention Ephesians 2.10. Anybody have it memorized? I'd love to hear it. God wants to hear his word prayed back, praised back to him. That we should walk in them. Thank you. May I ask your name? Tiago. Tiago. Nailed it. If you don't have that one memorized, I challenge you to memorize Ephesians 2.10. The Lord whispers to me before each class session begins, they're my workmanship. At very least, Ken, would you not mess them up? Coach them up, cheer them on, as Tiago said, prepared in advance for them to do, walk you in it. They're all walking. If they know the Lord, they're walking in it. Expect the Holy Spirit to be at work in you, in them, in the lesson plan, in the collaboration. And be at work as they depart for his glory.